Hi, I'm Rhett Talbot, and I'm coming to you today from the Philippines, where I'm reporting on aquarium fisheries and aquarium trade data as a special report for Reefs.com. This is the second segment in the series. Like the seafood industry, which may be considered the last bastion of wild food, the saltwater aquarium trade relies heavily on animals that are harvested from the wild. Most of the fishes that are exported to the United States, upwards of 80% of them, originate from two countries, Indonesia and the Philippines. That's a problem critics contend, given that both of those countries have such a poor track record when it comes to illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or IUU fisheries. The trouble with IUU fisheries is really multifaceted. There are obviously fisheries sustainability concerns, but there are also other issues ranging from destructive fishing practices like cyanide use to human rights abuses that we've heard so much about in the popular media. The consequences of IUU fisheries can be profound for the resource, for the fishers involved, and for those further down the supply chain. IUU fisheries thrive when there is a lack of transparency and an absence of reliable third-party data. And this has certainly been the case in the Philippines, both in food fisheries and aquarium fisheries. One way to address IUU fisheries is with data. These data may take the form of fisheries data, how many fishes are landed in a fishery, for example, or trade data, how many fishes are exported from a given country. Having data helps to uncover illegal activity. It can disprove false accusations against fisheries and against trade, and it can appropriately help managers plan and manage for the future. Having data makes sense to most people, but the aquarium trade has been very slow to adopt a data-centric approach. Some in the trade argue that getting the data is too costly and that it's not necessary anyway. They argue that most reef fishes are so plentiful and reproduce in such large numbers that it would be virtually impossible to overharvest them at current trade volume. I've heard more than one exporter in a source country tell me, we've been fishing this reef for 10 years or more, and we've seen no change at all. It wasn't so long ago when people perceived the sea to be a limitless, renewable resource. Fisheries didn't need to be managed, people thought, because there was no way such a plentiful resource could ever be overexploited. The trouble with such a laissez-faire approach to fisheries management is that the effects of fishing can be far greater than we think. And by the time we notice that something is wrong, that something has fundamentally changed in either the species population or the resource itself, it's often too late for a quick fix. The trouble with assessing sustainability based on what appears obvious is that changes may occur too slowly for us to notice. Year to year, there may be little observable change, but if one were to take a snapshot at the beginning of a decade and then at the end of the decade, the changes may be far more pronounced. This concept is often referred to as shifting baselines, where one generation of fishers may set their baseline on what appears normal or healthy to them without realizing that what they consider to be normal or healthy may actually have been considered degraded by the previous generation. In other words, over time, we tend to suffer from a collective amnesia of what a healthy fishery looks like. This is why we need data. We need baseline data to be able to assess changes over time, and then we need to use that data, not anecdote, to implement appropriate management measures and regulations. We also need data to help us respond to unwarranted attacks against various fishery segments by activists or NGOs that may be wrapping a political or ethical agenda in a claim of unsustainability. We've seen several examples in the past two years of how data, even imperfect data, can be an asset to the aquarium trade. Perhaps most important, data can help a forward-looking aquarium trade identify areas where improvement and even reform is necessary. In short, data really do matter. In the next episode, we'll look at how a group of scientists working in partnership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been working since 2009 to acquire and publish data on the aquarium trade. We'll look at both the strengths and weaknesses of those data, and we'll see how they lay the groundwork for the work that is about to begin here in the Philippines. Thank you for watching this series on Why Data Matter. I'm Rhett Talbot, reporting to you from the Philippines as a special report to Reefs.com. If you have questions about anything that I've discussed in this segment or any of the other segments, please feel free to reach out by either commenting on the Reefs.com posts or by writing me directly at my email, which is Rhett, R-E-T, at rettalbot.com. Thanks so much, and I look forward to seeing you soon.